friends, in this lecture, we are going to understand the diffractive multifocal IULs. The science behind the diffractive multifocal IULs have been regarded as a little complex with many rings or steps designed on such lenses. We will try to understand what these diffractive steps mean, what role do they play to help patients see the near and the distance in case of bifocal IULs and also near, intermediate and distance in case of uh, trifocal IULs. A few years back, I had the opportunity to see a lighthouse with some of my friends. In fact, there are very few people who would not stop by to see if ever they pass by a lighthouse. A lighthouse is one of those few things that has always intrigued us and caught our imagination. Standing by the sea or the ocean, the lighthouse has stood tall through this test of centuries to help men navigate through the many vagaries of sea life and reach destinations safely. Though the history of lighthouses can be traced back to the Roman Empire or beyond, the modern lighthouse optics is credited to Jean Augustine Fresnel in the 18th century. Prior to Fresnel, the lighthouse optics consisted of huge lenses that collected the light from an equally big lamp and threw it parallel or collimated many hundred miles over the sea for the ship navigate. Well, though this system of lenses and reflectors were installed to throw the light to the sea, it actually could collect this uh, uh, very little light from the lamp and send it back to the sea. So they could not actually trap a large amount of light. The reflectors and the lenses that were built, they could only trap only a small percentage of light. All prior systems, however, paled by comparison with the advent of the Fresnel lens. The advent of the Fresnel lens actually changed this. So Fresnel understood that much of the refraction done by these huge lenses could be replaced by a thinner lens with a step design. Each of the steps would, would bend the light by a certain degree to make the light emerging from the lamp of the lighthouse parallel, right? So thus Fresnel lenses allowed the construction of lighthouse optics with short focal length and large aperture without the mass and volume of material that went into prior medieval lighthouse optics. And in the next slide, we will see how a Fresnel lens would look like. Fresnel understood that these lenses, that much of the refraction done by these huge lenses could be replaced by a thinner lens, as I said in the last slide. And these lenses would have a step design. You design a step design. And each of the steps would bend the light by a certain degree to make the lights emerging from the lamp of the lighthouse parallel. The Fresnel lenses allowed the construction of lighthouse optics without the kind of, you know, the huge lenses that were associated with lighthouse optics prior to the advent of the uh, Fresnel lenses. Now, Fresnel lenses, it is important to understand, could be of many different types. It could be uh, light, from the lighthouse optics thrown to the far off sea parallel so that ships can view that light hundreds of miles away. Fresnel could be of different orders, could be first order, second order, third order, each of these orders meaning how this light is going to be projected, how far this light is going to be projected to carry the different signals to the ships, right? For example, lighthouses, could be erected, uh, you know, close to the harbor to guide the ships to the harbor. So those will not have a zero order of light going parallel. 
those will be of either third order or fourth order that is the light will actually be more focused and they will be having a focal length of short distances. Keep in mind that Fresnel lenses were constructed into many different types, as I said before. So a Fresnel lighthouse optics could be of zero order, that is the light is being thrown to the infinity for ships to see from hundreds of miles from the ocean. First order to six orders, all focusing at a particular distance from the lighthouse, depending on the need of uh, that place. A sixth order lens would throw a light at a very, very short distance, specifically placed at the harbor, right, to guide the ships go near the harbor. The modern day diffractive multifocal lenses are a concept from Fresnel lenses. As you would be aware, these lenses are stepped a sawtooth designed to create multiple focal points. And let me bring my pointer. So this is what you can see. These are actually steps over here, steps. And this is a cross section of the steps that I have drawn. So the Fresnel lenses applied in diffractive multifocal lenses is to collect parallel rays of light and focuses it on the retina, right? We, the, this lenses, that are adapted in refractive multifocal lenses for the patients. They collect the parallel rays of light and focus it onto the retina, right? But in lighthouse optics, however, the Fresnel lenses were designed to, to collect the light from the lamp and throw it parallel, collimated over the sea, right? So, they, 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 they were of two different, I mean, you know, concepts. The refractive multifocal IULs collect, uh, you know, the uh, divergent ray, parallel rays of light and converge it. While the Fresnel lenses in lighthouses, they collect divergent rays of light and makes it collimate, right? However, the basic optics, however, remains the same. So Fresnel optics together with Thomas Young's diffractive interference of light have helped to create the modern diffractive multifocal lenses. So these are the two names, Jean Augustine Fresnel and Thomas Young who have actually contributed a lot and uh, whose work has been adapted to today's diffractive multifocal lenses. So if you talk of Thomas Young, Young's interpretation of the wave theory of light showed the world how light could be played with to create constructive interference and thus orders of focal points, right? So light could be the waves that are coming out can, can be played with in such a way that they create constructive interference and that can actually be utilized to make the focal points. So ophthalmic scientists are heavily indebted to both Fresnel and Young for their contribution to optics and paving the way for modern diffractive lenses. So in Young's double slit experiment, the signs on which all diffractive multifocal eyelids based, light is passed through the first single uh, slit. Over here you can see that there, there is a source of light that would come and it would pass through this first single slit, right? And as it passes, it will spread out, you can see. So the light that passes through the slit spreads in and the spreading would be inversely proportional to the slit width. That is, if the opening is smaller, the spreading of light over here will be more. If the opening is bigger, then the spreading of light will be less. Right. Think of, you know, a lot of people is there in a room and um, they're trying to come out of and there, there's been a fire and they're trying to come out of that room from the door. If the opening of the door is small, then once they come out of the, of the room, they will spread out larger. If the opening is big, if the door opening is big, then they don't spread out that much, right? 
So the light that passes through the sleep spreads as it comes out of the opening. This spreading of light, as I said, is basically called diffraction. So this is basically diffraction. The spreading of light that comes out of the slit is called diffraction. Now, uh, in Young's double slit experiment, why do we call it double slit? Because this is the single slit. When light comes out, it spreads out, right? And when it spreads, it also comes across these two second slits over here. And as the waves pass through, this wave passed through the wave is of a single wavelength of light say for example it passes through these two slits over here they again become two secondary waves and as this secondary waves comes out on these two slits they will interact with each other creating constructive interference right and destructive interference also what do we mean by constructive interference and what do we mean by destructive interference? Now, when light travels like waves and you, you can uh, relate this to the waves in the sea. So you will see in the waves of the sea water will have a high and a low, right? The high is actually called the crest. And the low of that wave is called top, right? So when these two waves come out of from these two openings or two slits, as we call in Young's double slit experiment, they interact with each other. And when the crest or the high of the wave meets the crest of the other wave, that is the trough also meeting the trough of the other wave, when the crest of one wave meets the crest of another wave, automatically the trough or the low of one wave will meet the low of another wave. And this will create constructive interference. For example, again, if we go back to the example in the sea, when the waves meet and the high of one wave meets the high of another wave, there is a bigger sea wave that is created, right? The same thing happens over here. You get a constructive interference. And when the crest of one wave meets the trough of another wave, then these are basically the dark spots will be created. You know, the dark, this is basically the dark spots, right? So there will be interference of light. Um, in Young's double slit experiment, as it proves, there will be interference of light, and that interference could be constructive that interference could be destructive. It means destructive interference when the crest meets the trough of another wave, then the dark, then the destructive interference is great. And if you have a screen placed a few meters away from these two slits, you will find that the, there will be, a, you know, uh, there will be some images created um, of this constructive and destructive interference of waves. And what will be that image? That image will be a bright image and followed by a dark image. A bright image and followed by a dark image over here. These are bright spots. And then there are also, they are also followed by dark spots over here, right? So bright, dark, bright, dark spots are created. Now, in Young's double slit experiment, the the, you will find there will be a bright spot that is exactly opposite to the center of these two slits. Here, this bright spot, which is at the center of these two slits, is the brightest uh, bright uh, of all the of, of all the bright spots. This is called basically the maxima, uh, brightest maxima, and uh, this is also called as the zero order, right? So that is this spot this bright spot will be of highest intensity and this will be bang opposite to the two slits over here right if you have to um, relate this to the modern diffractive iuls right your brightest spot will be opposite to this uh, you know to the center of the diffractive element or the bullseye this bright spot will be always created 
well, you know, uh, the rays of light that actually hits this step over here and hits this step over here, they will create this bright spot over here, right? This will be the brightest spot of the zero order will be always opposite to this center of diffractive element or the bullseye over here. In Young's double slit experiment, all subsequent bright spots or maximas, all bright spots are, can be also called maximas, all subsequent bright spots will be of lesser intensity. And as you go far away from the center, the bright spots or the maximas will start being less bright. And same is also for the dark spots. The dark spots will be of less intensity also. Okay, so let's continue, you know, relating the Young's double slit experiment uh, with today's uh, diffractive angles. And if you see the steps over here, the steps basically, as I said, is more like the two slits over here. They kind of create this waves, right? The constructive interference so that you have the focal points. So if you have to relate uh, the Young's double slit experiment, the maximas that are created over here, the bright spots, uh, when light goes through the diffractive multifocal IUL, it also creates this bright spots, which we call as the focal point. However, there are a lot of bright spots created in Young's double slit experiment, but we don't need so many bright spots or focal points. For the bifocal IUL, we need only two focal points created, two bright spots. And for the trifocal IULs, we only need three focal points created over here. So accordingly, the Young's double slit experiment is adapted uh, to suit the interests of our patients in ophthalmology, right? The another point that I would also like to draw your attention over here is, uh, is you know, the steps we you will notice that the step widths over here are coming down. The step widths are coming down as you move from the center to the periphery. And why do you think that the step widths are coming down? The step widths are coming down. Remember, what are the slits doing? Yes, they are creating the constructive interference and also bending the light onto the screen. So, the, as you move from the center to the periphery, you need to bring down the step widths so that light could be bent more, peripheral rays of light could be bent more to focus it onto the distance focal point or to the near focal point, right? So, or both. So you have to bend that light more because you have to bend peripheral rays of light more than the paraaxial rays of light. So you have to bring down the opening of the two steps, steps over here, right? Remember I said, I explained this before, the law of diffraction. When you bring down the slit width or the opening, then you bend more, this, the rays of light spreads more, right? So that is what actually is done over here. The step width comes down. The question here is that how can we space the steps or the rings of the diffractive IUL over here? How do we space? Uh, at what distance do we need to keep the steps uh, from each other in such a way that light passing through the diffractive optics here fall on the two focal points over here, right? So all this rays of light that go passes through this uh, diffractive multifocal IULs either fall on the near focal point or on the distance focal point. So in, to um, reframe this question in terms of Young's double slit experiment, at what distance should we keep these two slits, the two openings at A and B, such that the rays of light that passes through the slit A and the slit B fall all on point P. That's my question here, right? So rays of light that goes, the waves of light that comes through point A will meet at point P, right? Uh, through slit A will meet at point P. The rays of light that passes through uh, slit B will meet at point P. And what distance do we need to keep these slits from each other 
so that they all meet at point P. Before I we talk about that, let me explain this to you. Uh, let me explain the wavelength of light, the concept of wavelength of light. And if you look into this picture over here, these are the waves coming in over here, right? These are the waves that are coming in and they will pass through the diffractive multifocal eye. And to understand these waves, uh, we we will we we I drew it uh, the crest and the trough over here. So these are basically the crest or the high of the wave, and this dashed line is signifying the low of that wave. So this is the crest. This is the trough. This is the crest. This is the trough, right? And what we say we we will talk as lambda is basically the wavelength. One wavelength of, of light is basically the distance from the crest to the crest over here. The completion of the cycle of the wave, that is it starts from this crest and then it ends on this crest. So this distance is, is basically the wavelength of light, one wavelength of light. Or you can also say this as the distance uh, from this trough to this trough or this trough to this trough that is the completion of a cycle that's basically the uh, the one wavelength the, the distance that's basically one wavelength of distance right so what we're trying to do here is trying to understand at what distance we are going to place these two openings so that all rays of light are now meeting at a point P. And if you look at this, the extra distance that the ray of light that is emerging from the opening P travels to point P is this, is this BD, right? So BD is the extra distance over here. So if we draw a line from point A to BP, such that that line AD cuts uh, the line BP at point D and such that it is at 90 degree, then this is the perpendicular. BD is the perpendicular. AB is the hypotenuse, which again is the distance that the two slits are. So sine theta here, sine theta is perpendicular that is this distance bd remember this is the extra distance that this this wave of light travels bd sine theta is perpendicular bd by hypotenuse which is this d right or sine theta is we can replace bd perpendicular remember bd by ab bd by ab ab is d so sine theta is bd divided by d which is the distance we are trying to find. BD is basically the one extra wavelength of light that has been traveling to reach point P. So we can replace BD as one lambda, one wavelength of light, right? So the equation then stands as D sine theta, D sine theta is equal to M lambda m wavelength of light so m is basically an integer of that wavelength depending upon which order we are talking of we are talking about the first order at point p so m the value of m will be one so d sine theta is m, m lambda so that will be the distance uh, that we need to keep between these two slits so that all rays of light emerging from these two points reach point P, which is our first order over here. So D sine theta is M wavelength of light, or M stands for an integer, right, which is basically the first order. So the value of M is one over here. If we have to relate this to uh, the diffractive lenses, at what distance are we going to keep the step? Remember, this is basically the center of the diffractive element. This is the refractive zone. Then the first step comes in, then the second step comes in. Likewise, there will be first, second, third steps over here also. So at what distance should we keep the steps, right? So this is the first step. At what distance should we keep the second step? 
after the first step. That will be common by the equation d sine theta, that is the distance between the two steps, is m lambda, that is which order we are talking of, d sine theta equal to m lambda. We said in the previous slide that constructive interference is created. That is the crest meets the crest from two waves emanating or emerging from two slits or two openings when the path length difference is either zero wavelength or one wavelength or two wavelengths and so on. That is an integer of the wavelength of light, right? So let us look into this pictures now. Here in the top picture over here, here in the top picture, the wavelength difference is zero, right? The wavelength difference is zero, but it is obvious that the two rays of light are also traveling parallel, so they're not meeting each other. So this is basically not something that uh, is desirable for us in designing the multifocal eye even. In designing the multifocal eye, what is desirable for us is basically making these two rays of light meet at that focal point, either the distance focal point or the near focal point. As in this picture over here, you can see this rays of light, waves of light that comes from S1 and waves of light that comes from S2 are meeting at this point over here. And in meeting, they travel equal distances, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So they travel equal distance. So the phase difference is zero over here, and therefore they meet at this particular point. If you have to, you know, uh, relate this to a different diffractive IUL, this point would be the zero order, right? Or often the distance focal point in a bifocal IUL. And this point will be at the center of the diffractive element or the center of the bullseye. So the rays of light will pass through the first steps and they will meet at the distance focal point or the zero order. If you go into this picture over here, you will see that the rays, we are now talking about um, the first order, right? In terms of the uh, Young's double slit experiment. Um, now, uh, let me back out a little bit. Let me explain you this slide over here, this picture over here. So the rays of light over here are also in are in line. They are also in phase, right? So you can see they are in phase, and therefore the crest of one wave meets the crest of another wave. The only difference between these two pictures over here is that the extra distance that is being traveled, remember in the last slide, the extra distance that is being traveled by the wave that is emerging from S2 slit. And what is that extra wavelength? One, two, three, four, five, six. And one, two, three, four, five. So this, this rays of light that is coming from the waves of light that is coming through the slit S2 is traveling one wavelength extra over here. However, they, they are in phase. The, both the two waves are in phase, and therefore the crest meets the crest over here, right? So they meet over here, and there's constructive interference. If you look into this uh, picture over here, the rays of light, the waves of light comes from S1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then there's the wave of light coming from S2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So here you have a five and a half wavelength, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, half, five and a half wavelength. And here you have the waves traveling 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 wavelengths. So clearly you can see that they're not in um, phase. There's a phase difference. There's a path length difference, right? Half a wavelength. How much is the difference? Half a wavelength. And that is why the crest of uh, the wave that is emerging from sleep S2 is meeting not the crest of the wave emerging from S1, but it is meeting the trough. And that is creating a destructive interference over here. If we have to relate it to the diffractive multifocal IUL, we'll always want this rays of light emerging from different states, always in phase, right? Always in phase. 
whether it is one lambda, it travels one lambda extra, two lambda extra, three lambda extra, no problem. In fact, it has to travel, the rays of light that travels from the periphery of the IUL has to travel an extra distance, right? So uh, these rays of light that travels through the periphery of the diffractive element has to travel extra distance to reach that place. So, um, so the, ray, the, the wave, there will be a difference in path length, there will be a difference in wavelength, number of wavelengths, but they will be, they has to be always, uh, you know, in synchrony. The crest has to make the crest, trough has to make the trough, and thereby create constructive interference to reach all lights onto the distance focal point or to the near focal point. Okay. So now to tie it all together, uh, let us assume that this ray of light is coming. I mean, this uh, wave of light is coming uh, and uh, it passes through the base curvature of the lens. Now, rays of light that goes through the base curvature of the lens, suppose it is a 21 diopter IUL, it is going to the far focal point, right? The zero order far focal point. But rays of light that actually hits the steps here, hits the steps, they are going to diffract. And we, we know from the Young's double slit experiment that when light uh, passes through the slits, they interfere it and they go through all the orders, right? Uh, they are not restricted to reaching just one order but they go to the zero orders, the first order, the second order, and so on. So light that actually hits the steps, they are diffracted or spread to the far focal point, which is the zero order, and which is also spread to the near focal point, which is in this case is the first order. And similarly, light also, some light also, is lost because it goes to the third or second orders and third orders. I'm talking in terms of a bifocal IUL. For a trifocal IUL, the second order will be the intermediate focal point, right? So this is how the diffractive multifocal IULs work. Again, the base curvature of the lens contributes light to the far focal point. But the steps, when light hits the steps, they are going to diffract and they are going to go to all the orders, the zero order, which is the far focal point in this case, in this bifocal lens, the near focal point, which is the first order also. And there are going to be some light loss and they are going to go to the other higher orders, like third orders, fourth orders. Right, and, uh, um, and remember in uh, a few slides back, we did talk about spacing of the steps. And how do you space the steps? Because the further you go to the periphery, you have to diffract the light more, right? You have to spread the light more because the light is going from the periphery. So the stepping, the space between the steps are going to come down. And the steps are spaced in such a way that constructive interference happens, light loss is less less of destructive interference happens. You know, destructive interference is when um, the crest actually is not meeting the crest of another wave, wave, but it is meeting the trough. So that's destructive interference. So the steps are designed in such a way that constructive interference happens. That is, the whenever the path difference between um, the rays of light that passes from one step and the other step is more than one lambda or more than one wavelength of light a step is created so that a constructive interference can be created right um, whenever this the, the 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 path difference is an integer of one lambda so they have to create the path difference between the successive steps as an integer of one wavelength of light that is it cannot be half. It has to be one wavelength of light, a two wavelength of light, three wavelength of light. This is how the steps are actually designed. So what would be the height of the steps and what is the significance of the height of the steps over here? We are so long we were talking about the distance of the steps. 
what would be the significance of the height of the steps if we talk about the height of the steps. The height of the steps or the rings helps in the distribution of the incoming light into the distance and near focal points. That is what percentage of light will be distributed to the distance and what percentage of light will be distributed to the near focal point. So the greater the height of the steps, more the incoming rays of light are directed to the near focal point because they create a greater phase delay. They slows down the rays of light more. So the greater the uh, height of the steps, more the rays of light goes to the near. And the corollary, that is the opposite, the less the height of the steps, the more the light is now focused onto the distance focal point, right? So keeping other things constant, the step heights are a function of the percentage of light desired to be focused on the near focal point. The wavelength of the monochromatic light that we are experimenting on, right? As well as the refractive index of the IUL, as well as the medium. That is, um, if you are talking about air over here, then the refractive index of the air. If you are talking of the refractive of, of aqueous, and the refractive index of aqueous. So these are basically the things that will govern what will be the height of the steps and what percentage of light you want to uh, you know, distribute to the near focal point. So these are basically the factors that is going to govern the height of the steps. All right, so that basically covers uh, in brief about the diffractive IUL signs and I look forward to you subscribing to my channel and logging into my blog quickguide.org. Thank you.